Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by the wonderful George Mackay to talk all about his current films, Femme and the Beast. And in starting with talking about Femme, um, there's so many kind of nuggets of information throughout the script, and I've heard you say that that was really key into figuring out who he was going to be as a character for you, even just details and things that he doesn't want to talk about, like when he talks about his time in prison, but he doesn't really want to go into it. Um, yeah. And so I was really interested in your process and how you worked with kind of those tiny details and, and the way that he constantly misdirects away from himself to really figure out who he was. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so thank you. That's a wonderful question to begin on. I um. Yeah, there's as 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 you as you said, there's um there's all these nuggets of sort of information because it's he's such an interesting character because he's sort of become a performance of himself. Like his kind of mask is because the whole thing's about drag. His mask is an aspect of something that is within him, but he's kind of using an expanded version of that aspect to cover another aspect. Um, and so yeah, he's kind of hard to get a read on because he doesn't want to be seen. But I, I just kind of was like, I love the kind of detective work of, of, as you mentioned, stuff like the prison thing. I think he'd like to appear to be, um, you know, tough. And I think he sort of, he wears that proudly, like, you know, I've done time. Yeah, yeah, you want, you kind of want that. I'll give you that. But I think the way then when he doesn't want to talk about it, I think there was a truth to just what a tough time that would have been as well. And I don't, and I kind of, it was a window into like, oh yeah, he didn't have a good time there. It wasn't an exciting tough like yeah there were the boys I imagined my thoughts always were that he did something that was kind of relatively harmless like maybe stole a car maybe joyriding something that you shouldn't do but didn't really put you know it was it wasn't a a vicious crime um and he just got caught and then once he was in prison given his short fuse probably extended his sentence by getting into a number of fights and then you know, almost like his life outside has sort of created a bit of a vicious cycle that he can't really get out of. Um, so there was that. And then one bit that kind of was the research is I'm not hugely fashionable in myself. Um, I have my own sort of sense of style, but I don't sort of keep tabs on what's new necessarily. And there's the the lovely scene in the when he sort of Preston starts to blossom and he talks about having a market stall and actually having some pretty, you know, some good ideas about wanting to kind of bring over certain fashion brands and the kind of street style that he would be into sam and ping put me onto a couple of kind of street style fashion blogs um that i think he would have been really up on like i think he would have been really current um and also because preston is he's a sort of bit of a peacock you know like he's part of his cover is this sort of fashion is is his exterior um so so sort of imagining uh, Preston's kind of like his interests and privately what his what his Instagram feed would be filled with was uh, was part of getting to know him as well. I also love that you bring up that detail about when he does talk about, you know, I've got these ideas and this is what I want to do with fashion because hmm. you can tell that he's quite shy and a bit embarrassed to bring up the idea of having ambitions for himself. Yeah. Um, and I kind of get the impression that he was probably raised in an environment where that was looked down upon a bit. Um, and so did you talk to Sam and Ping, your directors, a little bit about where you felt like he came from, his upbringing, and if he was perhaps just, you know, a byproduct of repeating cycles of abuse that he saw within his own upbringing and family life? Yeah, to like, totally. And thank you as well. This is such a kind of wonderful read on on, on the man. Like, yeah, I, I did. I felt like, again, sort of without meaning to be kind of uh, disingenuous and sort of treat kind of like parts of parts of London or kind of sort of make stereotypes about sort of like kind of certain classes or anything like that. But but I I, I always thought that I imagine he was from a, a kind of working class background, but a kind of old school working class. I think there is this sort of the ideas that of masculinity that sort of Preston hangs his hat on. And that also that that in a sense, when playing him, there are aspects of that type of sort of man that I revere. And that's what I found so interesting about the character is because the script is not just to kind of point the finger and go, this man is toxic. There's it's so interesting where in in also sort of looking at that, you also kind of it kind of gives um it's quite fair in the way it sort of says that it gives Nathan's character, Jules, power when he explores that type of masculinity. And that's sort of like old school way of being if you just do what has come before you and you just sort of that is kind of handed down and for many people that that doesn't that doesn't matter because they don't feel any different to kind of to that kind of lineage um 
uh, and, and that I felt therefore kind of came from like a sort of old school working class and, and East London as it is, is sort of changing so, so much. And, um, but those spots just outside, like kind of just beyond Barkin, Dagenham, where places where there was an industry, like, you know, the car factories and things that went and places where maybe culture went with it and the identity, the identity of certain industries and trades went and it kind of just became a bit of a non-spot, um, that, that I think Preston would have really kind of, you know, not just with his sexuality, but his interests in fashion, his interests in what was current would have felt out of step with that community. Um, so, yeah, so that was always an, an idea that he was this kind of like old school sort of working class sort of just beyond East London, you know, that kind of in between Essex and London, basically. Absolutely. And in, in talking about his anger and the way that he expresses that, I think there's a lot of delicacy in how you've kind of handled that in your performance, because when we meet him at the beginning of the film, obviously we see him engaged in extreme violence, but then we see how it exhibits at different levels and in different ways. So what does it look like when it's sexual tension? What does it look like when it's defensiveness, you know, against his friends, um, mm. you know, versus a stranger versus someone that he knows? And, you know, you kind of, you can't play it to the fullest extent throughout the entire film because that wouldn't be realistic. And so yeah. how did you set about finding those different expressions of anger and even just the different levels of it well i remember without sort of giving away too much obviously the sort of the main point of violence kind of is almost like the inciting incident of the film is this attack on jules and i remember we filmed that scene which was you know it was a horrible scene to film and is a is a is a brutal scene in the film um but i remember we actually like sam and ping came to me and said look we need a bit more footage for you know we've we've edited an assembly of that but we need a bit more footage and so we actually did a pickup day later on in the shoot at another location after we'd finished another scene and what sam and ping got me to do was they said they, they eventually started said now talk as if you're talking to yourself talk to yourself the part of yourself that you don't like and actually sort of there's elements intercut with the sort of scene involving everyone where actually it was a very personal moment where i was nathan was there off camera to support me you know, and, and act with me in the scene. But essentially, like, no one, we were in a different location. I didn't have any of the gang there with me. And it became about sort of Preston talking to himself, like, who's the big man? You think you're this, you think you're that. And and there's sort of, it's there's so much self-hatred in, in Preston. It became, that was a sort of big part of accessing the kind of specifics, as you say, is, is to not just like what level one to 10 angry he is, but what what is he angry at? Um, and uh, and that sort of did the work for it. It kind of it didn't think so much about like, you know, this is a big anger or a small anger. It was like, okay, is this to himself? Is this about not being found out? Um, and also one of the other Easter eggs that you sort of mentioned about like little nuggets of information is it, I don't think it at all sort of justifies or admonishes, not admonishes, um, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of the word, but sort of in no way forgives Preston for, the atrocious violence at the beginning of the film, but you get one scene where his mates sort of let slip that they, that's what they do is they wind him up is that he, they get their fun out of like, they say he's like a pit bull dropped in his head. Like if we just bait him, bait him, bait him. And then we let him go. And you just think like, fucking hell, this, excuse my French. It's like the, you just think, man, this, this guy is not, is not, is, is not only having a sort of tough time with himself. He's not, a, he's not a, a kind man necessarily, but he's also an environment that is constantly pressuring and pushing him, winding, winding him up so that when something does, he's got such a kind of, such a short fuse and such a kind of like, um, what is it? Like a hair trigger. Um, he's ready to go whenever. And there's, there's so many great external elements that you were able to utilize for your performance as well from, you know, the tattoos, which like tell a story from different phases and different points in his life of expression, um, you know, to his hairstyle and even just the dialect of the character and the fact that you yeah. also kind of physically bulked up more muscle to play him as well. And so especially kind of going through that experience of like bulking up and adding more muscle and, and having those tattoos put on. And then just once you started to talk to him, were you able to take aspects of that immersion and just seeing the way that people around you would respond to you differently in those settings into the character as well yeah totally totally and it's and that's one thing that is kind of fascinating is 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 as much as it is a kind of he is a sort of cautionary tale to not be led by your fear and not to sort of like kind of create an armor around you there was legitimately something really sort of seductive about feeling powerful 
you know, feeling physically strong, feeling with that haircut, also men reacting to you differently as well. Like, you know, just in a sort of like animal kind of like, oh, all right, all right, man, all right. kind of like there was, and there was this one time on the way to, I was on the way to work and I was sort of during the rehearsal period, which we only had like about a week when we were there, but it was as the haircut was happening and we were testing the tattoos and Nathan was testing all of Jules's looks. And I kind of like, I'm always myself, but I like to sort of keep like one foot just to sort of, you know, before you get started, almost kind of ramp up into the, the performance and into filming. So I was kind of in my own clothes, but I was in the sort of, I was in a track suit, I was in black trackies, black top. And I'd gone home with a bunch of the jewelry because I don't wear much jewelry usually. Um, and I had my hair all slipped back and I had for a test. So I had all the tattoos on my hands and everything. And I was on my way to work and I was sat in a cab and at this separate crossing in front of me, this guy, some this fight broke out. This guy got flung off his moped by this other fella. And I just sort of just hopped out to kind of just try and stop it, to get, to kind of get involved. And, and basically was kind of go, whoa, 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 what's going on? What's going on? And I saw the guy who was sort of the aggressor kind of clock me. And there was a kind of moment of like, okay, because I had, I had the hair slipped back. I had no hair here. I had the tattoos. I had my rings. I had every, and I was kind of, and I was sort of, you know, I don't know if it was just because of press. I was like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? You know? And, and it was like, I could, I could, I could consciously say, I was like, oh, he looked at me and kind of took the measure and went, okay, yeah, that's not like I'm scared or anything, but almost like a, yeah, we're equal here. And it was really interesting because, you know, I don't walk around like that. I mean, here I am sort of floppy hair than a loose shirt. Like I would, I know that I wouldn't have got that reaction um, had I not been dressed as Preston in that moment. That's such a fascinating experience to have. And, yeah. and in terms of the character as well, it's quite interesting to watch Preston go through developing emotions for someone and trying to show a more vulnerable side, but just not having that ability to express it. And it seems like mm. I'm not going to be able to say I'm sorry, but I'll tell you that I'll get a new phone with 5G or yeah. you know, I'll get <laughs> yeah. you a sweater that's not a knockoff. Um, yeah. And so what, what was kind of the fun in getting to explore those aspects of what does his vulnerability look like? Because it's still masked in this exterior that he's presented presenting to the world yeah it's, I mean that's that's a lovely thing thank you again so much this is so lovely to sort of talk about it in these terms and and you'll read on on everything like but I, yeah I, I thought that was also intrinsic to understanding Preston in terms of again these characters or people who perhaps you know don't operate in a sort of open way and the point of the story is that they're like there is an opening and a blossoming but what was fundamental to understanding him was like I don't just don't think he has the capacity he's so far from that it's not that he's like this sort of emotionally articulate man who sort of has experienced a bunch of sensitivity and ha literally has the words for it to kind of go okay now I'm feeling this and I can express this he's like there's a sort of blockiness to Preston, which I thought was really sort of fundamental to the playing of him, where he's like, I just, and, and it, ironically, it's a sort of, again, broad brush jokes, typically masculine thing of like, I had it with a, an old, you know, a guy I used to live with, you know, you'd say like kind of chop veg and that veg would be chopped, like perfect squares, tiny squares, like the whole thing. And, you know, my dad used to get him to follow a recipe and he's like, what's a knob of butter? Like I need specifics, like give me, give me boundaries, give me clarity. And I think like, you know, Preston's a bit like that, that when he does get these feelings that he doesn't understand, he he almost, he almost can't understand why he can't understand. And so he has to sort of, he just has the language that is available to him, which is kind of like gift reward, you know? Um, it, yeah, there's a, there's a sort of, there's a, in a sense, there's a sort of simplicity to, to how he, to how he interacts with people. But that said, due due to the kind of lack of nuance in certain interactions, I think it almost, my way of thinking about it was almost that like, if all of us have like a sort of 100% meter of feeling and the more nuanced you are, you can kind of deal in percentages. I think he kind of deals in 50%. And so therefore what he gives you is incredibly strong because you get 50, you know, he doesn't kind of go 1%, 5% or 7% or 9%. He's kind of like what he give you is limited, but what you do get is incredibly like there's a there's a there's a clarity and a weight to that. And 
it, it must be quite interesting as well playing a character that you know is masking to different levels and in different ways in front of different people in his life you know the moment that his friends come around if he's with Jules the way that he kind of tightens up and tenses up and has to be yeah. hyper aware of everything he's doing but you get the sense that there really is no moment of letting loose you know that he, there's that point where he's like chastising Jules like don't text me a picture of yourself because you never know who could be looking so yeah. he spent his whole life being on guard um and so for you what did you want those differences to be in terms of you know when he's constricting himself in that way I, th I think um, it was sort of it's a, it's a tension that's intrinsic to the whole piece. So I kind of was followed this, the script that Sam and Ping wrote and that we got to enact was so beautiful and so tight. And to be honest, was the clearest roadmap as to what they were thinking, what the stakes were. Um, I, and so sort of I, I basically just followed what was, you know, what was in the script. But in terms of like the understanding of it, it's something that, you know, it, it became it became sort of this is it there's this sort of it's a as i say I said earlier the film's about drag and that this sort of like this kind of second self and i think it is also quite a modern thing that like with with the internet with a bunch of stuff we put like a version of ourselves out there and that version almost becomes mortal you know it becomes life and death and if that sort of second self gets found out or gets broken it is the equivalent of like a mortal death and that's how i used to think of it in terms of that like you know my life is not in danger this is just a question of sort of embarrassment here but if you know in, in terms of preston but like if my cover gets blown so to speak that is the equivalent of death it is like it really is i think he thinks of it in terms of those terms those that those stakes are like my life is over if someone finds out um because you know, and that, that that just helped me understand it and kind of to play it again. Maybe it's quite a Preston, quite a simple way of thinking of it, but I just I made it sort of more mortal than figurative. Absolutely, and and I also wanted to ask about the experience of working with an int intimacy coordinator alongside Nathan mm. on this film because I've heard you say that the the intimacy coordinator on this project was really key in making sure that all of the intimacy was completely story driven and completely character driven. Um, yeah. You know, even down to there's details in an encounter that they have later in the film that reflect some of the movements from the initial attack and the initial encounter and the inciting incident at the top of the film. Um, yeah. And so, how did you set about kind of creating that dance? Because again, it's it's such a fascinating kind of power play between them throughout in that regard yeah 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 that was um again well firstly that comes from again Sam and Ping's script where I mean Sam and Ping knew that and put that in there that the sort of the intimate relationship the sexual relationship they have is as much of the storytelling as everything because even within the sex they have they are playing roles for each other you know whether I don't think it gives anything away that the sort of the first time they they have sex Preston is kind of when they they meet earlier that evening I think he's hoping for something different and then misunderstands Jules to assume and is sort of actually very hurt that he thinks that he wants me I that I think that he wants me to play a different role for him and so I sort of almost give him the performance that I think that I want which is in no way what Jules wants whatsoever but it's also part of the greater plan so that's and anyhow, so we knew how sort of fundamental that was. And, and Robbie Taylor Hunt, our, um, our intimacy squad, was just amazing in his sensitivity, his pragmatism, in helping us articulate and understand that and sort of bring it to life, like in an expert way and sort of even like the nature of the orgasm, the nature of the the sort of the moment of climax, um, the, the nature of how they how they move together, like the position that they take and what, and always kind of sort of analyzing it as to like, okay, well, what does that say? And it, doing it as a character, like if I want to say to you, I'm going to put you in your place, in what way will I touch you? You know, that, and kind of thinking on it in those terms. And in a sense that like, that also made it just about, it kind of was a healthy level of separation as well, where you kind of go, this is totally part of the story in the way that when I say these lines, it's the character saying those lines. And when I do these things, it's the character doing those things. So yeah, Robbie was really amazing in his detail, his manner and his, his just his grace about the whole thing. And, and he was really fundamental to helping us articulate the physicality of everything.
And in switching over to talking about your other film, The Beast, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's kind of a monumental challenge to come in and play a character where you have different versions of them. You're learning to speak French for the first time. There's different dialects to the character at every point in the movie. Um, and so what was the starting point for you in, you know, going back to that idea of just what were the kind of like the key nuggets in the script and the details that you had early on to just start figuring out the roadmap of how to approach something like that? So that was, um, I mean, it was just an, an amazing challenge and, and, a, and a wonderful opportunity. The first thing was when Bertrand sent me the script, um, he sort of, there was an, a note with the email that came with it saying that the point of, of Louis and Ona, both of them, is that they are three different versions of the same person. And so it was always clear that I needed to find out what was the root, like, of that person because it's a it's an idea that fascinates me in general like how much you are the the person at your core or what is what is the sort of center of you that doesn't change in terms of context and how is that center of you influenced by you know the town you grow up in the school you go to the friends you keep the experiences that you have um so it sort of was like the kind of the perfect petri dish to explore that question and again so then in, in working out what that core was, obviously the film is actually, it's Gabrielle's film, it's Leia's character's film, and it's called The Beast. And it's called The Beast because the film is based, the seed of the idea is based on a Henry James short story called The Beast in the Jungle, with which, within which the beast is a metaphor for the fear of love and the fear of commitment. And is basically like a it's a metaphor for a fear that you think is there that's constantly out of sight, but it's a sort of existential foreboding. Um, and it is both in the book and in the film, it's the thing that draw these two people together in the way that sometimes when you, you meet a great love or you meet a great friend, there is something where you're like, I know you, I know you inside of the world. I, there's something that you and I, there's an intrinsic understanding that only we have. And that is a very powerful thing. And I think that that is the, the thing that bonds Louis and Gabrielle, myself and Leia's characters, is that they share this fear. But ultimately, the tragedy is, is it's the thing that potentially gets between them always because they have this sense that there will be something that destroys them. And it's the thing that they bond over, but it's also the thing that gets them in the way of kind of ever completing fully the love that they share. Um, but as I say, but because it's Gabrielle's film, it was always said that Louis is Gabrielle's beast. As much as he understands the beast, he is the thing that she fears herself, even if neither of them know it. He is always the thing that destroys her. So there is a kind of terrible quality to Louis in all stages, really. Um, and that was the thing that I kind of was like made the through line. And that is just basically, that's an idea. You can't really kind of physicalize that, but I'm just a person in whichever point who feels fear, you know, who is potentially controlled by fear. And I felt like in 1910, you know, then it was about the way that the context would either suit or not suit that that person and that 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 quandary. Um, so yeah. And and because you were just bringing up the fact that obviously that's quite hard to physicalize amongst the different iterations, mm. you know, they're they're so different. It's like when you're playing the earlier time period and it's much more kind of self restraint in that particular mm. point, and then you're playing like an Elliot Roger type incel. Mm. At, a, at another point in it. And so there's kind of a very different physicality. So how did you kind of find the different physicalities of the role? Well, I, I kind of started with, I mean, obviously the script is kind of does so much. It kind of tells you, tells you the direction to go. The, the, the 1910 portion of the film is definitely the most sensuous, flirtatious and sort of sexy of, of, of the three periods, I'd say. Um, and so kind of leaning into that sort of idea of someone who, in terms of, I think, whatever fear that Louis experiences, he's almost kept safe by the time and therefore he can be at his most flirtatious because the rigidity of 1910 means that the smallest gesture is quite a large transgression. And therefore he's kind of actually quite powerful because he's totally fine to hold hands and to take her on a date when she's married. But it doesn't mean that he necessarily follows through on the whole relationship until obviously metaphorically it goes where it goes. So I kind of felt like I wanted to lean into that. You know, when either in yourself or people, you feel safe within a context, it's like almost like a first date where you sort of go, 
the likelihood is we'll just go for a drink. And so I can be totally my best self as funny or as open or as flirtatious as I like, because I know it's not going any further than this tonight. You know, it's then the sort of second, third, fourth date where you're like, oh my God, we're actually going to meet. And, you know, you might see me naked and you might find out stuff about my past at this point. You know, that's the sort of, that's when you kind of, you know, start ticking over. So I felt like Louis, the first Louis exists in that first date kind of sensuality and an enjoyment. And that's how he lives his life, basically. Then the second one, Bertrand was like, okay, this is a man who suffers from a deep existential fear. And to do so in the culture of modern America with the internet, a culture based upon high achieving of a sort of alpha mentality, especially maybe amongst men, um, it just kind of festers in him. It just, it, it becomes so great that it kind of turns inward and it turns spiteful. Um, and then also watching the, you know, as you said, it, it the, the the monologues that that section of the film begins with are almost verbatim Elliot Rogers. And he has a very unique physicality in the way he sort of expressed those equivalent monologues that he said. Um, and I, I borrowed a lot from that physicality. And then the fourth was just trying to be almost as kind of, that's the closest I feel that, that that's when Louis and Gabrielle have as, as much kind of, real potential as they'll ever have in terms of a meeting of minds and so therefore it was just about trying to kind of have a looseness and a naturalism that you know in and that they sort of they're almost like the best match that they could have been in that third period and it, it's so interesting to watch the way that each version of him has a different relationship in terms of just that emotional vulnerability going back to what you were talking about where there's that constant push and pull of you know wanting something but then the fear that kind of steps in the way and you know obviously the the kind of incel version is a very different version of what that looks like in terms of mm. what he's wanting and how he's preventing it um and so how did you want to play around with that idea of what does his fragility look like in, in these different iterations of the story yeah it's kind of just the same thing i mean yeah, once I had that understanding of what I felt and, you know, had spoken at length with Bertrand about what that fragility sort of how they were expressed in each one, it was sort of, um, I don't know, I just, I, I, I guess it just sort of came about with like the 2014 Elliot Rogers kind of version there is a, it became covered but a bit like Preston really, it becomes covered with the bravado, but it's a bravado that is slightly less, comes less naturally and is more put on in the way that Preston it is a bravado that is like, okay, I've got this part of me, I'm going to make that part bigger because that's, you know, that is a truth about me that's going to hide this truth where the the 2014 Louis was kind of like, I don't quite know how to be, so I'm going to take this thing and put it on me and therefore it doesn't quite fit in the same sort of way. Um, and then... Yeah, and then and then the sort of, I get, yeah. So I, I and then I'm sort of nineteen ten. For I feel, sorry, I feel I'm sort of losing myself in in sort of answering that question a wee bit. But um, yeah, I just kind of once I sort of understood the way that they cover that fear, I just sort of lent into expressing that really. And in terms of, of preparation, I've heard Bertrand say that basically you were kind of emailing a lot because I think you came on board to this project fairly close to production. So there wasn't mm -hmm. even very much time for you to build all of this out, but that you would email back and forth and kind of dive into questions. And is that very much the way that you like to approach character, no matter what the role is in terms of just, you know, doing as much of a deep dive at the beginning so that when you go into filming that you can just kind of shed that and, and not be living in it as much? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's also sort of to be, I think, worth worth saying as well. Like I came to the production late because tragically, I, I, you know, I came off the back of a very sad situation where the part was originally written for the French actor Gaspar Oliel, who, who tragically passed away when the film was initially in pre-production. And so there was this, there was a hiatus as Bertrand and the team decided what they wanted to do. And then they looked outside of France and that's when I auditioned and came on board. So, I, but in terms of a process of work, like, yeah, I, I it depends with each one. I I love to prep. I I I I enjoy prep. Um I find it a fascinating part of any job. Um and I and I do believe there's there's goodness, goodness that kind of comes from it, um, hopefully. <laughs> and uh and so yeah, it, it, with this one, with it being there being the biggest task was the French, basically. And then it is quite a intellectual piece as well. It's quite cerebral. And so it became and the and the structure of it is all on top of one another. And there are sort of clues about past. There are moments within each time zone when they sort of, because they are the same people who are on repeat through time, 
have a moment where they sort of recognize that they've known each other from another life, but they are the same person. And, you know, there's, there's so many kind of like beautiful little nuggets to grab hold of it. It kind of just became about discussing it quite intellectually was a big part of it really. Um, and yeah, and it was just, I don't know, you work with, sometimes you get a job and you wind up being on location, you're living with the director or you're staying in the same dig. So you just have meals together and you're talking about it or you're talking in the accent where with this Beth Fund and I were, were quite separate other than the brief periods of time, like a, a few days prep and weeks in between then a few days then we began basically. Um, so I just, uh, yeah, it became it became sort of an intellectual discussion to, to to nail down what his intention was, so that then to hopefully just I could hop in and serve it. Yeah, it definitely feels like a film that you could watch multiple times, and every single time you're going to kind of pick out different meanings from all of the threads in it. And and yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, they're, they're both nice. stunning. Little... Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh no, no, sorry, no. I said yeah, no, totally. And there's like little hints, like I, I did I'd stuff like I, I mean, no one. It's funny because I said to. Um, I enjoyed the sort of threading the, the three parts together and there is my pocket watch kind of wire that is um, that sort of chain that is on my waistcoat in 1910 is actually the bracelet that Louis wears in, in 2014. And I remember telling Leia and she went, it's fantastic. No one will care. <laughs> so, so, I love um, details like that though, even if they're just for you. <laughs> Yeah, even though it's totally for me and I said, you know, I was trying to get it through all, all, all three and um, I'm trying to think if there's any others, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, yeah, that's it really. Well, they're both such fantastic films and I think such great examples of, you know, the incredible range that you have as a performer. So it's been such a delight to get to talk to you about both of these fantastic projects. Thank you so much, George. No, thank you for your time and for your read on, and you know, and seeing both projects. I really appreciate it.